uh, takes a couple of seconds to start a live. Okay. I have already done it and it's on the process. It may take 20 seconds for it to... That's all. Okay. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, welcome. Okay. Good evening, madam. Good evening. Good evening, Narendra sir and Shain, sir. Good evening. Good evening. So, everyone is uh, here. Welcome, Jandi, ma'am. Thank you. Can we start? I think we should start. Please. Okay, I, I would like to... 71 members have joined, sir. Start. Can we start. Can we, I want to verify whether the residents who are supposed to present are there. <laughs> we have some audio disturbances. Prashant, please, uh, please mute. Tejasvi, please mute. Okay. I request uh, all the persons other than the uh, person actively discussing, that's the faculty, as well as the resident who is actively discussing. All others, please keep your uh, mic in the mute, as well as the uh, video also in the off mode. Okay, this is to ensure that we have good quality of sound during the discussion and we don't have extraneous sounds, as well as to ensure good quality of video transmission. So, except the active faculty we're discussing and the student, all of this keep the, in the mute, okay, the mute form. Second thing, uh, if you have any <clears throat> response to the questions, uh, you can, after the uh, student or resident has answered, if you have got any comments or questions, you can put it in the chat box. Okay. And uh, of course, Narendran sir, what do you prefer? You want others also to answer in the chat box? Uh, that, I think depends on the questions. We'll... Okay. You can open it out to the uh, 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 resident concern or to the, all the residents. It is up to you, sir. Yeah. Okay. We'll With these words, uh, I will start. Welcome to today's ISC PG clinics. Uh, today's session, we have uh, an OSCE on acute diarrheal disease. Acute diarrheal disease are actually seldom discussed in our clinical practice, even though it's a very common problem in our community. And uh, as OSCE is the uh, style of examination, one can expect uh, OSCE on acute diarrheal disease also. So Professor Narendranathan said that it will be a good idea to have this topic and I readily agreed because this has not been discussed at all. And I have never heard a discussion on acute diarrhea in any of the academic meeting as well. To have this, we have Professor M. N. Narendranathan, who is the former professor and head of uh, Department of Gastroenterology of Government Medical College, Thiruvanthuram. He had a long innings there as HOD, and he has guided many students and have a lot of pub publication in his name. Apart from an astute clinician and gastroenterologist, Professor Narendranathan is uh, interested in statistics and epidemiology. He has an, an MPH in public health. And uh, he was uh, the director of England for many years. Professor Narendran also was the chairman of ICMR committee for research projects for many, many years. So he has a lot of credits to his account and the students must be extremely uh, lucky to have somebody like Professor Narendran again agreeing to take the clinics today. <clears throat> and the co-faculty today is uh, Dr. Shrein Sadashivan, who is a professor of uh, gastroenterology at Amurda Institute of Medical Sciences. <clears throat> Dr. Shrein, interest is in luminal gastroenterology and he has a lot of publications to his credit. Welcome Professor Narendranathan and uh, Professor Shine to today's clinics. And I welcome all other faculty members and all the other students as well. The faculty, the students are Dr. Joe from Aster. Are you there? Yes, sir. Dr. Tejasvi from uh, <clears throat> Medical Mission Chennai, Madras Medical Mission. Yes, sir. Dr. Snija from Aster. Yes, sir. Dr. Rohan from Sims, Chennai. Yes, sir. Dr. Sadish from Pushpagiri, Tiruvalla. Yes, sir. Dr. Aniket from VPS Lake Show. Yes, sir. Okay, and Dr. Vivek Joshi also has agreed to uh, discuss. And if needed, we can rotate among the uh, list of students, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vergis uh, Thomas. Uh, before uh, going to the topic, I'd first like to place on record the tremendous work 
And I think we have to appreciate what Dr. Vargas Thomas is doing, you know. And the way it is going on, I think it's just superb. I think you deserve all the credit, Dr. Vargas. And so then because of others' cooperation, sir. Yeah, I think, and you also you know you are able to get people like Jayanti and uh, other people. And then if I listen to a talk, the one of the sessions by Dr. Jayanti and Abby, and I think that if my this class reaches anywhere near that, I'd be more than satisfied. It was one of the best presentation that I have, uh, case discussion that I have seen. Jayanti, ma'am, is always there in the back, background, sir. We always I, discuss and plan program according to yeah, our really, discussions. How they get time to join these things, and I think really great. And then one of the things which I would like to tell um, the postgraduate students is that you, we know that there are different stages. You know, in the summer actually exam going, some have just joined, and some are already halfway through. But what I would like to say is that whenever we ask questions, this is not an exam. I'm not trying to test your knowledge. We are just trying to take off a discussion, that's all. And to err is human. There is no one who has always is wrong. So don't feel diffident at all. Even though there are so many people listening to you, you always be confident and answer it because people go wrong. And we just want to take a discussion, we start a discussion and we want to know how you are before we, uh, what, uh, what is your approach to that sort of topic before you start on the discussion. And with these words, I would like to start. But before that, Dr. Shine, would you like to share something, share a few words before we start? Uh, definitely, sir. It, it's a great effort from Varghese Thomas, sir, to coordinate. And then it's actually uh, during this uh, lockdown time also, you are taken so much of pain. And then and uh, the, the, the postgraduates are really lucky to have a session like this. And uh, we have uh, Madam, Dainty Madam, and all stalwarts of uh, gastroenterology to help these um, postgraduates. And, uh, um, and about the today's topic, actually, initially when uh, the topics were given, I was also surprised that we never discussed uh, ac acute diarrhea. In, in We have a lot of cases of chronic diarrhea being discussed. But when I uh, went through the topics which are given by Narendra sir, I also learned a lot and it's very informative. And thank you so much for uh, giving this opportunity, uh, Vargis Thomas sir and Narendra sir. Thank you. So should we start the ball rolling? Can we go ahead? May I know the, um, who is the uh, person who is going to the opening batsman from your side? Joe from Asta. Joe, you are there? Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Welcome, sir. As I told you now, be confident and then answer. That's all what we want. Because we know. That. Okay, let me just take the you know, first case here. A 66-year-old lady underwent a total knee replacement surgery. On the third post-operative day, she developed mild fever, abdominal pain, and loose stools. Antibiotics were stopped because she was the mild fever, and they switched over to meropenem. And the labs were sent, the fever was persisting, diarrhea became worse, and the frequency increased. There was no blood. Total count went up to is about 12,000. Procalcitonin was 2 nanogram per ml. And when we just examined, she was not dehydrated. Uh, she was uncomfortable, tenderness in the lower part of the abdomen. Otherwise, the pulse rate was around 90. Otherwise, everything was OK. And we have, we have not done any scopies or anything. So what I would like to say is that what is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? Um, sir, uh, six, uh, and since the patient has got a uh, post-surgery and uh, since she has fever with uh, loose stools, and uh, total count has also gone up. So I would uh, strongly su uh, suspect a hospital acquired infection like a prosimative cell infection because uh, fevers, the diarrhea is worsened. And uh, since there is fever, it indicates it's more of infective. Sir. Like what you said, like what is your first diagnosis? Um, Hospital, uh, sir, either antibiotic associated uh, diarrhea, most probably a clostrum difficile. Okay, very good. Thank you. And uh, you, you have hit the bullseye. Whenever a person develops a diarrhea in the post operative period, uh, of course, the thing that tops the list is C. difficile. But I think now surgery on the abdomen can have uh, diarrhea because of uh, resection of the stomach, resection of the bowel, resection of the pancreas, and the biliary tract surgeries can 
and then drug induced uh, drugs can produce diarrhea sometimes laxatives but we always think that the diagnosis of clostridium uh, c difficile infection should be suspected in patients with acute diarrhea which is more than 3 to 2 stools 24 hours with no obvious alternative explanation like uh, um, laxative uh, intake particularly in the setting of relevant risk factors like antibiotic use hospitalization and advanced stages i think you are right dr joy no what are what are these organisms can i want all of you to write in the chat box what is the complete name of this organism can you please write all of you the name of this organism i want all of you to write down please write the complete name of this organism i'm not getting anyone no no i think it is uh, that the c difficile well, i just want you to write the complete uh, name c difficile complete the complete name of c difficile yeah only one person has written yeah 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 everyone i think yeah 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 that is one thing yeah karthik is it yeah yeah i think karthik samir very good i think saji yeah, very good very good oh i think those, so you know this thing so what i would like to say here is that Clostridium difficile, uh, C. Clostridium difficile was reclassified in 2016 when it became necessary to assign Clostridium difficile to a new genus. Following the restriction of the genus, the Clostridium buteum. I think it, uh, people said that if you want to call it as Clostridium, it should confine to the characteristic of the genus Clostridium buteum. And then the crucial complication came when the analysis showed that the C. difficile. should actually be included in the family called Peptostreptococcus. This prompted the suggestion that Clostridium difficile be assigned a new genus, and they called it as Peptoclostridium. But you know, it becomes confusing, and there is already the term Clostridium is already there. So to retain some of the spelling of the old genus, so future accounting for the difference was less urgent. The term Clostridioides was coined. So now we call this as Clostridioides difficile. and not clostridium difficile 2016 onwards this is the word this is the term clostridioides difficile c difficile i think so last 5 years the you should not use especially gastroenterologists who are up to date with literature should not call this as clostridium difficile we should call it as clostridioides difficile i think this is one of the things which i think wanted to stress to you that they have changed the name of clostridium difficile about 5 years back and it is called as clostridioides difficile and then you know what of the joy thing which of the following is uh, are risk factors for recurrent class c difficile one is male sex children chronic kidney disease and the seeds intake of drugs like and the seed what do you think is the what do you think is the which of these will you tick when you are given the option um sir and the seed i'm not sure sir yeah. which one would you tick and the seed sir And I say, does it? You don't think male children are writing? I will just go through the, the correct the answers for this. The female sex, no, it um, occurs in people. Uh, the person that I presented here is actually the wife of a surgeon. Uh, female sex, age about sixty-five, chronic kidney disease, immunosuppression, antibiotics, proton pump inhibitors, and steroids are the risk factors for clostridium difficile. Uh, Doctor Shine, would you like to add something here? Yeah. Uh, what are the newer risk factors of Clostridium difficile? Do you have any idea about Doctor Joy? Uh, uh, it's a PPI, very uh, chronic use of PPIs, yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, uh, use of uh, prolonged antibiotics. The newer yeah. antibiotics, uh, the and yeah, yeah. Uh, prolonged Take hospital it. stay is also considered as a risk factor because it's a nosocomial infection, sir. Yeah, only is actually you uh, rightly said it is taking PPIs, and other uh, is actually a patient with inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. Because as you know, they will be on uh, steroids, then they will be on several antibiotics, and also newer interventions. 
like when you do a um, endoscopy colonoscopy endoscopic ultrasound ecg so we are doing lot of uh, invasive procedures and these are also a risk factor for cross stream diffusion uh, infections okay go ahead doctor uh, uh, shine uh, why your hospital is an important reservoir can you uh, doctor shine you can carry on please uh, joe joe what do you think the cause uh, we think that the hospital is an important reservoir for uh, clostridium difficile uh, infection uh, sir uh, because the most common uh, way of uh, the by, by way it spread sir uh, and unclean or uh, properly not uh, cleansing your hands after you examine patient to next patient and also the common things that we use because the thermometer is also considered and the other uh, commonly used like a sphygmometer thermometer all are considered to be uh, carriers of uh, the spores of cdf so yeah in hospital because of un unclean or uh, non sterile technique uh, while examining patients increases the yes the the use uh, the answer is actually the spores of clostridium difficile the spores okay. of clostridium difficile can survive up to 5 months okay. so that's why it is one of the the, the commonest reservoir hospital is one of the commonest reservoir and 20 to 30% of patients are, will be who is admitted to the hospital may have this clostridium difficile and 66 about two third of them will be asymptomatic Karen, Dr. Shine. Okay. Okay. So, the, uh, can you describe this uh, colonoscopy findings? Um, this colonoscopy shows the classical uh, the exudates or the uh, pseudo membranes that we see in the on the mucosa. So it's actually the neutrophilic in like the thick neutrophilic infiltrations, uh, the, the collection of neutrophils uh, that we can see as a pseudo membrane on the mucosa. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's a pseudo membrane. So the pseudo membrane it's actually arises from the point of a superficial ulceration. So as you said, there there will be acute inflammatory cells, chronic inflammatory cells in the lamina propria. So there is okay. a combination of fibrin, mucin, and the debris of the sloughed off epithelial cells along with polymorphonuclear leukocytes. This forms a pseudo membrane. Yeah. Okay. So I think, what are the antibiotics that can uh, precipitate CD infection, Doctor Joy? Uh, sir, uh, the most common antibiotic we all encounter is uh, like clindamycin is considered, but also a lot of cefalosporins and uh, the other cefalosporins, uh, the penicillin, fluoxetines, all are considered to be sir. So the yeah. crux is uh, if you prolong antibiotics in a patient who is already immunosuppressed, yeah. adds the risk of CD infections. So uh, you say that a person with C. difficile has got antibiotic induced. Uh, the antibiotic you are stopping the infection as soon as you made the diagnosis. You want to switch over to another antibiotic. Which one would you choose? So it depends on the uh, like. We can uh, most commonly use drugs are uh, vancomycin, metronidazole, and fedoxamycin, yeah. sir. Yeah. So, uh, I, but it's sulfonamide, cytokine, yeah. vancomycin, metronidazole. These are things which do not. But I, you know that. We seldom use nowadays use sulfonamides and tetracycline. I have started using recently mainly for H. pylori infection. The others are not very common. And aminoglycosides. So these are, I think, good antibiotics which you can use instead of that thing. I think. You know, how do you confirm the diagnosis, um, sir? It, uh, actually, it depends on the. Um, so, you so you want to confirm it? How do you confirm the diagnosis? Uh, sir, it depends on the uh, this various tool tests that are available for uh, confirming the diagnosis, sir. Uh, what are the things we should do? Uh, basically, it is uh, divided into both toxins that we test and also the uh, GDH, that is an enzyme that we uh, test. Very good, very good. GDH is actually the enzyme. So how do you send the stool? How do you send the stool? Uh, freshly collected. Uh, Sample, sir. It should not be collected from the diaper. It should be directly. Like to take off from here. Always test in a doctor. Shine over there. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Well, when you uh, take the stool, no. Always test a diarrheal stool. 
You know why? Uh, to get the yield factor, sir. Yeah, basically, you know, even in a normal healthy colon, the 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 C diff can concentrate. So if you take a normal stool, so you so you the always you have to take a diarrheal stool for a proper stool test. That's number one. If the patient liquid is stool. yeah liquid stool, and if the patient is unable to produce a stool, suppose the patient is having toxic mega colon, then how will you test? Uh, sir, you can take an aspirin or colonoscopy or a sigmoidoscopy and take. Oh. No, it's basically you have to take a perirectal swab. Okay. So you can take a perirectal swab and you can send it for PCR. Yeah, I think there, there is no point in repeating the test within seven days, but I think the PCR are not done in Trandrum. I don't think many people do PCR for C. difficile, uh, C. difficile test. So I think the two things that you do are the GDH, the antigen test that you said, and the toxin A and B. Is there any other toxin that is uh, produced by the C. difficile? It produces a toxin called binary toxin sometimes. And uh, among toxin A and toxin B, which is more uh, uh, toxic, toxin A or toxin B? Toxin A is considered to be more toxic. No, toxin B, I think. Toxin B. Yeah. So GDH is positive in almost all types of uh, uh, the clostridioides. And so a positive is a GDS does not mean that the person is having. Uh, yes, so it, is, it just shows that it may be uh, uh, present in the stool that sits. So you yeah. cannot confirm the toxin. And then if your toxin is present, then you can know that um, uh, the infection is there. Uh, but as we don't go into NAT, we don't do NAT in our office. So I don't want to go into those details. If both are negative. You can safely say that it's not there. If GDH alone is positive, then I think what you should do is that uh, if the GDH alone is positive, contains a positive, or a culture alone is positive, and do not contain toxin, treat only if you strongly suspect that they have cytosol. If there is a pseudomembrane or anything. Otherwise, this is mainly because is uh, the C difficile, clostridioid is difficile, may be found incidentally even in the normal stool. So presence of GDH alone, or a culture which we don't do here, uh, well, GDH alone may not suggest that the person is having C difficile colitis. Thank you. Okay, sir. Uh, so what are the antibiotics that you give for C difficile? Uh, sir, uh, vancomycin, uh, metronidazole. Uh, okay. Uh, Spidaxomycin. How much is the... Depends on, sir, the... the yeah. uh, this is actually the yeah. first... But I think it's not a right here. I think it also might. Uh, we have not used it. Uh, we use mainly metronidazole and vancomycin. But ticoplan in rifaximin, tigicycline are all advised, but they are not recommended by guidelines. You know, they are all advised, and uh, there are many reports saying that these are effective against these things, but these are not recommended by guidelines. So the two things that are available to us are metronidazole, vancomycin. So if the patient is asymptomatic, there is no need for treatment. I don't think we'll ever find asymptomatic people also. Mild disease, just stop the antibiotics and see. Mild to moderate disease, we should give metronidazole or vancomycin for 10 days. Severe disease, give vancomycin orally and IV metronidazole. You can even give vancomycin rectally. In the case, you can give combined therapy with IV metronidazole and oral vancomycin. Lopramide and um, antispasmodics are avoided in these people. So I think let us uh, go to uh, Dr. Shine. What about the, how do you assess the severity and things like that? Dr. Shine. Have you heard about Atlas scoring system? Uh, sir, uh, I haven't heard of them. Yeah. Sir, I haven't Atlas, heard of Atlas, but uh, I know how we divide it into severe, mild, moderate infection. Yeah. Let's me, let, let, let me let me explain the atlas okay. no, a means okay. age age a means age t means temperature l leukocytosis a albumin and the systemic concomitant antibiotic use so this, okay. this is the this is how this at the word atlas came so you rightly said there are actually mild moderate and severe and when when will you say it is mild and when it is severe Severe, like if the counts are more than 15,000, there are features of paralytic ileus or toxic megacolon and features of AKI, like renal failure with the more than one point. 
Okay. Any other score, uh, scoring system you know? Uh, sorry, sir. I don't know. There are, there are three different uh, severity uh, criteria assessment scoring, scoring system. One is a, uh, the hospital specific guidelines. Then we also have Society for uh, Healthcare Epidemiology of America, that is uh, SHEA and IDSA, that is Infectious Disease Society of America. So, and then we also have a SAR criteria. So when you, when will you say it is fulminant uh, clostridium difficile colitis? Uh, when the patient with toxic megacolons and yeah. when the patient presents with uh, uh, hypotension, okay. they present with shock, and they also will present with features of peritonitis and they, uh, uh, with ileus and megacolon. So that okay. is a that is a fulminant colitis. One of the yeah. Things which I would like to say is that I have never seen uh, very severe cases which require surgery. I have never referred a person with surgery, and I asked a few gastroenterologists. They are also of the same opinion. Uh, Doctor Jayanti or Udia, have you ever sent one? Uh, have seen patients being C. difficile being referred to surgery? Doctor Vargis or Vargis Thomas? Or have you had any experience in seeing such? Not severe type. Not seeing the severe type. Not seeing yeah. Moderately severe. Yeah. Any, anyone who has seen severe types of repairing surgery, I have also not seen. No, we have seen one case of very severe uh, C. diff. I'm not seeing the person. Who is that? Yeah, um, uh, it is Krishna's uh, here. Oh, okay, no, okay, yeah, yeah, tell me. Okay. So we have seen very, uh, very severe case of C. diff. Oh, okay. This lady had some pulmonary problems, given a lot of antibiotics, uh, and she had a background of IBD. She was having Crohn's disease and presented with severe C. diff. Okay, okay. I think almost fulminant C. diff, but luckily she did not have to undergo surgery. Uh, but you said that you gave her your specific treatment, no? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That is what is. Uh, I also have not seen any fulminant. Uh, okay. uh, and state. recently we had a patient with uh, mucormycosis, oh. bila bilateral blindness. Uh. She also presented with a very severe C. diff, and we tried the same thing, oh, okay. and she has also improved. Thank you. It's not, it's only severe, it's not fulminant. So, clostridia is one of the import, most important cause of diarrhea and AIDS patients is uh, C. difficile. Why is that? Uh, Dr. Shine, can you take over? Yeah. See, uh, the is one... there? Is there? Joy, have you left the place? Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, why is that uh, it is C. difficile is uh, one of the common cause of diarrhea in uh, HIV AIDS? Uh, sir, the immunosuppressed. And also use of antibiotics, more of antibiotics. And for and we might, we and might then, be on uh, empirical and uh, prophylactic antibiotics. And more frequent hospitalization is it's also okay. one of the important reasons why they can have a um, diff infection in AIDS patients. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, at least uh, three, four cases being referred for FMT. So, when will you refer this patient for a fecal microbiota transplantation? Uh, sir, after the second recurrence of yeah. if a patient with a C. diff, you should always uh, give an option of FMTs. Yeah, more than three recurrences. After the second. Uh, yeah. So, what are the what are the ways by which you can uh, do FMT? Um, it can either be instilled via a naso uh, jejunal tube or in form of freezed capsule or uh, via uh, an endo endos or colonoscope and insulin the right side. So for, a, for a C. difficile, which route you will prefer? Uh, sir, uh, the, colon the colonoscope, sir. Yeah, Direct definitely. Sir. Definitely the colonoscopy route. For the liver, no, definitely the upper route is, is preferred. No. But the lower one, you can either instill it into the splenic, up to the splenic fracture or it is always better to inst instill this uh, into the right column. Right, yes. So, Fulman colitis is an indication for surgery. Okay, thank you. So, now we'll go to the next case. Dr. Yeah. Joe, thank you. And uh, I welcome Dr. Tajasvi from uh, Madras Medical Mission. Tajasvi, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay. So, Tajasvi, ma'am, you are welcome. And my, this is a case report presented by, from something from Vellur. No? It was presented by, no, it was published from CMC Vellur. 
And looking at the X-rays, even I couldn't make a diagnosis. So I'm just asking you whether you can make one. We are presenting to you. This is a letter written to a letter to the editor written by the author from CMC Velu. We are presenting to you a 42 year old female who presented with multiple episodes of small volume mucoid diarrhea for five days and mild generalized abdominal pain for one day to her emergency department. She had developed psychotic symptoms following the recent death of her sibling. She was living alone in an old age home. You now see 45 years, 42 years in old age home. Clinical examination revealed a dehydrated, thinly built woman with a depressed sensorium and louse in the station. Her abdomen was soft, minimally tender, and sluggish bowel sounds were there. And this was the plain X-ray of the abdomen. She had not taken any contrast or anything. Um, I think I couldn't make a diagnosis by when I looked at it. Uh, Tejas, we could you can you make one? What may be the diagnosis here? Uh, could it be a uh, functional, sir? No, what is this uh, white things? What white things that you see here? Can you make any guess of the thing? That could it be hardened species? Hardened, uh, white, white, it's hard to find. So uh, what happened was that this lady has the, was in the habit of taking uh, small stones, you know, she used to take small stones and the stones, um, yeah, and uh, she used to take the stones. And the stones, uh, when you recover them by, it was recovered by digital disimpaction. This was the plain X ray after taking out the, by digital disimpaction. And this case was reported by Rajendra et al. from CMZ Vellur, and they called it as lithophagia. What do you call this thing when a person you know, takes these stones and clay and mud and things like, what do you call this thing? Here, look at the person is having a, a breakfast and one person is taking nails. What do you call this habit of taking these things from for, as a food? What do you call this thing? Uh -huh. What is this habit called when you want to take things which are not naturally food? You want to take some clay? Pika, sir. Eh? Pardon? Pika, sir. Okay, very good, very good. You're great, I think. Yeah. Okay, that is it. What is, uh, by definition, what is pica is a disorder characterized by persistent eating of substances of non-nutritive substance or of, um, which are not of nutritional value for at least one month at an age for which it is developmentally inappropriate. That is what we call pica as. Common substances include clay, matches, stone, hair, ashes, toothpaste, hair, and feces. Have you seen any case of pica? No, sir. You're not seen. I think you have heard about it. Where have you heard about it? So this uh, occurs in pediatric age groups, sir. Pediatric. Anywhere. Where is it more common? So more common in pediatric age group. Uh, where they... Anyone in your family had a uh, pica? Anyone? It's not at all uncommon to see. Any anyone? Can you answer this in the chat box? Where where can you see the? Oh, yeah, pregnancy. Yeah, very good. Yeah, what is this Galaxy Tab? Who is this Galaxy Tab S3? Because pregnancy is one condition where you may get this one. Okay. So it has commonly been associated with pregnancy, iron deficiency, zinc deficiency, celiac disease, renal uh, dialysis, schizophrenia, and so on and so forth. And family strip pica. Uh, uh, Dr. Shine, would you like to say something? Yeah, in the spica, there are several uh, terminologies like uh, if you take sharp objects, we call it as acuphagia. Then amylophagia means laundry uh, starch being taken. Similarly, coprophagia means human feces, animal dung. Foliophagia means leaves, green, grass, etc. Then uh, uh, geophagia, dirt, sand, and clay. Lithophagia, Sarah has already mentioned, rocks, gravel, and pebbles. And pagophagia, is ice uh, and also freezer frost and, and tobaccophagia that is cigarette butts and we all know that trichophagia we, uh, everybody might have a uh, uh, lot of gastroenterologists might have seen about uh, uh, hair being removed from the stomach now coming to uh, uh, this is a uh, case again presented uh, in, this is published in 2020 this is called silophagia that means uh, Paper eating. So I just present a, this is a patient, a 28 year old lady who is already diagnosed with SLE and she presented with lower abdominal pain and bleeding PR. So when they did a colonoscopy, you can see there are 
lot of uh, uh, toilet fragments of toilet paper inside and in the subsequent uh, uh, picture shows the 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 toilet paper is seen in that picture so this lady was actually having iron deficiency anemia and when this iron deficiency anemia was corrected with the iron replacement therapy the unusual craving resolved so this is a case of xylophagia i think one of the methods of treating this is preventing contact with the substance which is abused and then give a replacement for this so like iron and zinc and all when you replace we may find that this goes off but sometimes you know as when they form bezoars and all it can lead to problems and when they eat a lot of uh, things like hair and all it can lead to malnutrition so pica is something that sometimes may occur aggressive management yes. well, let us come to the third case who is that who is who is the thank you dr tajeshwi dr snija from uh, astra medicity dr snija yes, are you there yes okay dr snija kamawa welcome so this is a 20 year old medical student are you listening yes sir yes sir uh, is uh, reports with passing loose stools of 3 days duration no blood or mucus no fever no abdominal pain urine is normal in color no increase in thirst does not interfere with interfere with this routine activity now he is a medical student that's why he came directly to the gastroenterologist i proceed before we go into the discussion of this case can you tell us what is the normal stool frequency of a person can you just tell me what is the normal stool frequency can be 2 to 3 per day pardon so it can be uh, yeah, go ahead be loud i think uh, there is nothing wrong in giving a wrong answer because uh, this is not a great question or this is not something that is near thing or it can, a, it yeah. can vary from person to person it can vary from 2 to 3 per day to uh, 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 twice or thrice in a week very good i think you are right there it is 3 per day to 3 per week is one of the definition that is given very good it is generally believed who have a greater frequency of stool is it male or female what is your there is one study done from bristol who has a greater for stool frequency females i think sir females i think sir no that bristol study said males i don't know i don't know the answer Uh, so what is uh, how do you define diarrhea is defined clinically as an increase in stool frequency and fluidity of motion with or without abnormal constituents like blood pus or mucus so what do you do in this person this person now how do you classify this diarrhea as this diarrhea of four days duration now how do you what is this diarrhea as it's an acute diarrhea acute diarrhea yes based on the duration what is uh, what is acute uh less than 14 days is acute very good and then more than 14 days uh 14 to 30 days is persistent diarrhea very good yeah it's chronic diarrhea super acute diarrhea is less than 2 weeks and persistent is more than 2 weeks and chronic 30 days i thought that no i can shine here that people may not know the answer depressed i am okay and depending upon the severity of the illness you can divide it into severe moderate or mild don't go into the classification number and things like total disability due to diarrhea severe disease able to function but with forced change in activities is moderate disease mild there is no change in activity so this person is having what type of diarrhea this medical student Ma- mild diarrhea sir mild acute diarrhea yeah so what will you do what are the investigation will you do in this patient stool microscopy blood count stool culture colonoscopy or none of the above what are the what are the tests will you do in this patient none of the above very good i think you are really great i think here yeah, none of the above so stool culture is now in positive results only in 1.6 to 5.6% of case of mild acute diarrhea and i think so it generally believed that most watery diarrhea is self limited and in 3 to 4 days don't go on wasting your resources testing is not indicated in this patients you do specific diagnostic investigation is indicated in when there is severe dehydration severe illness persistent fever bloody stool immunosuppression or nosocomial infection or when you are part of an outbreak this is where you do the investigation very good so how do you manage this person how do you manage this patient with encouraging increased fluid and diet and uh, diet what diet you will give him a normal diet 
Yes, sir, she can be. Yeah, you can take a normal level. Some people say that uh, they don't allow milk. In uh, India, which state do you know has the uh, maximum lactose intolerance? Do you know which state? There was a study done by Rakesh Tandon at all a few years back. And they found that um, Kerala, no, the lactose intolerance was, in South Indians, the, the lactose intolerance is very high. And the, uh, it was very low in Punjabis. So which, uh, do you give drugs to control diarrhea in him? It's not required, sir. Not required, yeah. Do you give probiotics or prebiotics? And not much evidence have there, sir. You don't give. Will you give antibiotics? No, sir. You won't give it very good. So I think can, um, so what are the, you know that when you talk about drugs to control diarrhea, many of the Western guidelines, you now there are lopramide, racicodotyl, many of the Western guidelines don't talk about racicodotyl. Do you know the reason why? Why is that uh, they don't talk about racicodotyl? I'm not sure. Well, I think this is not licensed in the US. No, that is the main reason. So can I, Dr. Shine, can you take off from here? You know what are the the uh, the type of op opiate receptors? Yes, sir, there are five receptors. Yeah. Um, a mute subtypes, mu one, mu two, carbon, beta, sigma, and, epsilon. And, yeah, there are. See, of which the we you know that uh, we have en enkephalins. Yes. Sir. Enkephalins will bind to delta. Delta and the the lopramide will bind to. New receptors. New receptors. So uh, the uh, encephalin. What is the what is the function of encephalin? It in, it, uh, it reduces the level of cyclic AMP, and encephalinase it it uh, it uh, causes it degrades encephalins. Okay, and cyclic AMP when it is increased, it in, in, induces the secretion of water and electrolytes. Now, coming to the mechanism of action. So, what is the mechanism of action of uh, uh, what's the mechanism of action? Uh, it will inhibit the cyclic AMP level. Yeah, oral and encephalinase. Actually, it, it inhibits the oral en encephalinase. So, what happens in this uh, cartoon, you can see here, when encephalin, is, uh, the, the level is increased, it will bind to the delta receptors and it increases the cyclic AMP and thereby it increases the water and electrolyte mm -hmm. secretion okay, okay so whereas actually if you take uh, the the mu receptors which is basically uh, uh, so the, in the mu receptors what happens the intestinal smooth muscles are uh, uh, stimulated so what happens and the encephalins are not that much stimulated so the uh, the next slide sir so when you compare the side effects of racicodotyl versus lopramide we discussed that lopramide activates the mu receptors and it increases the intestinal transit time. So when the intestinal transit time is, is uh, increased, what happens? There is bacterial overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth, and they can also develop toxic megacolon. And then if you compare the, the constipation, so even after once, once a diarrhea settles, the constipation prolongs in lopramide. Whereas, 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 so okay. in Rasika okay. Dotral, okay. 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 which binds with the delta receptors and okay. it reduces the hypersecretion. Okay. So, Rasika Dotral will only act during hypersecretion. This is a very important point. So, once the, the hypersecretion is over, the constipation will not be prolonged. So, it's a short lived constipation. The, one of the side effects of lopramide is a prolonged constipation and also back to lower growth. So what are the uses of uh, uh, racicodotyl? It can be used in any diarrhea. We can also use in uh, rotavirus diarrhea in children, HIV associated diarrhea also we can use. Okay, the 5S23 receptor undergoes, can you name some of them? They are good bowel binders, no? 5-H3. Very good. Contacetrone. Yeah, good. Then? Anything else? Paleocitrone. Yeah, palnocitrone. Very good. Okay. Carry on. Shine. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, Ramacitrone. So these are the 
and uh, we know that they are basically used for anti emetic uh, especially in chemotherapy uh, induced vomiting but they have specific action in the colon they prolong the colonic transit they also inhibits the small bowel secretion and also they decrease the colonic complaints also you know any disease where serotonin plays a uh, major role in diarrhea any disease neuroendocrine tumors yeah i think you know the recently the covid right. so it may be the st receptor and may be more useful in uh, you no know, one of the mechanisms of covid at diarrhea in covid is supposed to be through serotonin so romocetron in diabetic diarrhea okay the ramisetron it, it it's actually we know that it is it is useful in diarrhea predominant ibs and in case of di diabetic diarrhea it actually we know that there is a classic sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic nervous system is affected in diabetic diarrhea but the enteric nervous system is also affected in diabetic diarrhea so there is an imbalance between the the, the neurons containing nitric oxide synthase and uh the uh, increase in enteric serotonin content also so this imbalance is actually uh, the ramocytone inhibits excitatory neurons in the enteric nervous system so by uh, uh, ramocytone playing a, it's, it it balances the the level of nitric oxide synthase and serotonin content and thereby it it reduces diarrhea in diabetic patients So what about uh, probiotics and prebiotics? Will, will you give this to this person? Uh, in this person, it is not required, sir. Not required. Very good. The use of probiotic for the treatment of acute diarrhea in adults is not recommended, except in the case of antibiotic-associated illness. Prebiotics are not. What are prebiotics? Can you just give me a name of a couple of prebiotics? Couple of prebiotics. in in fructose oligosaccharides and things like that can you shine can you take up from that thing okay yeah now this, these are actually some of the new advances in in the in the uh, area of pre and probiotic development so what what are the the advantages are the research tools it can be used as a research tool the real time microbe and the functional research in vitro and we can also do a silicon model we'll come to that what is a silicon model silico models and there is also genetic characterization and modification these are all for the research purpose similarly for the clinical application regulations and safety personalization alignment of health and microbes and clinical evidence of cause and effect and there is some other effect in the society for ex for example another thing is a, there is another novel application is detoxification so we know that some of these metals are absorbed from the intestine and this probiotics and prebiotics they have a uh, ability to prevent these excess absorption of these metals so they have a role in detoxification similarly education communication and clinic, uh, clinical evidence okay good so this is actually a silico modeling so what do you, what do you mean by silico modeling it's actually a computer modeling so in the field of prebiotics and probiotics silico modeling has come wherein it stimulates a human biology it also helps to in the progression of that developing a disease researchers can visualize and predict the human response to specific drug drug or substance the advantage is in the due course the animal models will be taken over by the computer modeling this is called a silico modeling and the prebiotics and probiotics now they, they are actually coming into the silico modeling so we are going to get more and more uh, development in the field of uh, silico, the probiotics and prebiotics so this is actually um, or the the osmotic capsule a new capsule so we all have a problem whenever we want to uh, acquire samples from the duodenum if when you take a, a jejunal aspirate what happens is there will be contamination from the oral mucosa so here so in order to collect collect the uh, the samples from the duodenum jejunum and 
the the small intestine we can use a osmotic pill what do you mean by osmotic pill you can see here there is a there, there is an opening here and an exit here so you can see here there are helical channels are there so when the fluid from the intestine gets inside you can see here a semi permeable membrane so it comes through this and then this the 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 solution uh, uh, will enter into these capsules so when it is the when you can see here the capsule is coming from the uh, esophagus then comes to the stomach it has got a enteric coating and then you can see here the capsule is moving with the peristalsis and very interesting thing so you can see here if you want to concentrate on jejunum so you can see with the help of a magnet they can adjust the the time the the capsule remaining in the jejunum so this is very this excellent way of collecting the samples of the from the the area of interest so this is actually going to revolutionize this that is osmotic pill is going to revolutionize the sample collection from the gut micro microbiome can you trigger can you make it open it from outside or is it can you control it from outside yeah, actually sir with the magnet they, we can control the one of the one of the problem with this capsule is actually yeah, yeah. It, it is the it is the gravity is actually controlling it just like we know that sometimes the transit time varies from person to person this has got a disadvantage because we can just continue the movement yeah. just with the magnet but we cannot the movement is actually controlled by the gravity okay then i think we will not go into the oral rehydration therapy i think that's fine so what are the embryic in a, a which all situation do you give antibiotics in acute diarrhea when the patient is immunocompromised or the patient is of severe disease yeah severe disease fever of more than 6 stools per day volume depletion features of invasive bacterial infection like blood and the presence of comorbidities just to put it what are the antibiotics which are recommended fluoroquinolone what are the harm in giving antibiotics what is the harm why you said you won't give an antibiotic to that person what is the harm in giving so most of the infections are not due to bacterial infections it could be okay or toxin mediated or uh, uh, maybe due to viral infection okay respond to the uh, antibiotics what is the side what is the hazards of giving antibiotics now when is resistance development of antibiotic resistance uh, it can really eradicate normal flora it can prolong the illness by super infection with c difficile prolongation of carrier state as it happens in salmonella or oh, do you know what is induction of shiga toxin do you know the about that what is that what is that it increases the it is it is observed that when we treat patients with uh, shiga toxin producing e coli there is increased incidence of uh, hus hemolytic uremic syndrome how how is it why is that what is the reason for it maybe this antibiotics are stimulating the uh, bacteria to produce yeah, the antibiotics produce toxins lysis so the toxin that is present inside the bacteria gets out that's one of the mechanism they say what are the mechanism by which they develop resistance do you know what are the mechanisms by which they plasmids have... huh? plasmids plasmid Pla uh, what is that uh, the number of bacteria which are there the those which are sensitive get killed by this and those which are um, resistant grow you no know, when you give an antibiotic and these antibiotic as you said can transfer uh, by um, by a means of a pilus it can transfer the genetic material from one bacteria to another through this it can even transfer the resistant to another bacteria you know about this no plasmid transfer okay so the evidence does not support empirical antimicrobial therapy for routine acute diarrhea infection except in case of travelers diarrhea where the likelihood of bacterial pathogens is high use of antibiotics for community acute diarrhea should be discouraged as epidemiological studies suggest that most community acute diarrhea is viral in origin and is not shortened by the use of antibiotics so these are some of the bacteria so the recommended antibiotics are azithromycin 500 mg single dose or ciprofloxacin levofloxacin or rifampicin 
I won't go into. I think now we will go to next person. Can I have the next person? Thank you, Dr. Snija. Now the next is Rohan from uh, Sims, Chennai. Dr. Rohan. Yes, sir. Dr. Rohan, you are welcome. I think I'm just going to show you a video. See the thing and. Now to the misery on two separate cruise ships tonight. The CDC this evening investigating how hundreds of passengers on two different ships became ill. Both ships now back at port and the extreme measures tonight on those ships underway. ABC's Brandy Hip reporting in. Sick and tired. That's how passengers aboard Royal Caribbean's Legend of the Seas described part of their vacation tonight, now on dry land in San Diego. Brooke Fagan is one of the 133 people falling ill. Well, I was in and out of the bathroom for quite a while the entire day. So I think that this is, a, and there are many outbreaks have occurred in ships. There are certain schools have to be closed down because of this. So what do you think is the reason for it? Is it because the sea, why do people, is it because of the sea sickness, viral diarrhea, bacterial, or due to something in the food? What is the reason for these types of diarrhea? I feel this is a bacterial diarrhea, sir. Bacterial. Or it can be uh, another possibility is of, a, I would keep a differential of a viral, viral diarrhea also, sir. Viral diarrhea, which virus? Uh, sir, uh, um, and this uh, rotavirus or uh, intro norovirus. Mainly in children, no? In no, norovirus. Yeah, norovirus. Very good. So, this is norovirus. Very good. I think, I think our DM, our postgraduate students are really good. This is norovirus. Uh, and you know that that was recently, you know, just a few days back, there was mass diarrhea and vomiting cases in ANP districts. And people are falling sick and coming, and the microbiologist is not able to isolate. I thought, looking at that, reading the description, that this could have been a norovirus diarrhea. This is what I felt. You know, so this is a norovirus diarrhea. And uh, congratulations to you for making a very good diagnosis. This is a norovirus diarrhea. You know, if you look at the, there are noroviruses described from India. And if you look at the India, the, it is 8% of the normal people and about 15% of the people with diarrhea have, have norovirus in this thing. And why, why I presented this was that I thought this is one of the underdiagnosed things that many people with norovirus are walking around. Like the epidemic, uh, that um, episode that is going on, the outbreak that is going on in Alapi, I have strong feeling that it could well be uh, norovirus diarrhea unless I, and our microbiologists have not been able to culture it. And you know that it produces um, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, and vomiting. And you have to protect yourself from uh, you. If you wash your hands very often, wash the fruits and vegetables. And it's actually uh, spread through certain types of shellfish called the zebra. Shellfish is something which contains the norovirus. Clean surfaces and wash laundry. When you are sick, don't prepare food for others. So this is something which I think may be very much present in our Henry, would you like to go ahead, this shine? Yeah, the norovirus is is established a, a viral plague. So when when a, a viral diarrhea, vomiting, and suddenly it develops in a group of people, a cluster. So we have to think about the possibility of a norovirus. Okay. So this is another the uh, in. Uh, 2018, there was a plane which uh, went from um, Dubai to New York. So just after, so the, when the, the flight reached New York, what happened? Suddenly the patient became sick. Uh, around 100 people became sick due to diarrhea, vomiting, and then um, and, and low-grade fever. And it was identified as uh, due to norovirus. So uh, as Sir said, it is mostly in uh, ships, but it can also happen in um, uh, flights as well. And uh, recently, there there has been next slide, please. Uh, th there has been a, 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 a outbreak in 2017. There was a, a, a large outbreak of norovirus from China, Wuhan itself. There was a, a large outbreak. Thank you. Thank you. I think you have been correct in diagnosing the norovirus. Can we have the can, next? Can Rohan continue, sir? The, the next is another case. Is it? Okay. Rohan continue. Yeah. Or you okay. want to speak to another person? 
letting her more questions he had a million dollar uh, question that he answered okay so yeah uh, this is a 55 year old man this actually happened you know um, uh, i was uh, a doctor who was in uh, working in a hospital he was actually in owning owning a hospital so he called me saying that their gastroenterologist from leave uh, can i come and do a colonoscopy for him because uh, his uh, some of his relatives are got um some of the relatives have got carcinoma colon and uh, so i went and did a colonoscopy the whole scope was normal but the next day morning itself the person developed diarrhea with mucus occasional blood and increased frequency what is the possible diagnosis dr rohan yeah uh, preparation induced colitis could be a possibility preparation induced colitis which preparation bowel preparation for the colonoscopy no no bowel preparation now can bowel preparation now blood and how can it or it could be uh, chemical colitis sir it what uh, due to uh, uh, glutaride dehyde or uh, very good the disinfect disinfectant yeah. used yes. glutaride dehyde colitis yeah glutaride this just is a glutaride dehyde induced colitis dr shine would you like to yeah basically you can see there there is a linear uh, patchy erosion you can see along the the way the, the pre previous colonoscopy has gone so when you see these pictures you should always think about the possibility of a glutaride in induced colitis and there are certain risk factors when the patient is having hypersensitive reaction especially they are allergic to several drugs latex allergy allergy to iodine allergy to shellfish these group of people are more prone to develop uh, this glut chemical uh, or glutaride in induced colitis thank you okay uh, this there are, there are some differential diagnosis can you just uh, 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 one or two differential diagnosis for glutaride induced colitis yes sir if uh, the patient is uh, old uh, he has comorbidities and ischemic colitis uh, can be one of the differentials Uh, based on the appearance, if there is necrosis uh, on the uh, colonoscopy pictures, uh, Inf infectious colitis is a more infectious, infectious colitis. Is, yes. First, first differential diagnosis: infectious colitis, infectious. and then it can be ischemic colitis also. So the most important thing is when you do a, uh, the 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 st post sterilization, rinsing is very important. Not only rinsing, you have to make sure that the colonoscopy is dried properly. Can I just add one thing, sir? Yeah. In olden days, uh, the conventional uh, colonoscopy preparation was associated with uh, giving enema, and people used to give soap and water enema as well. Yeah. And soap and water enema was routinely given prior to delivery, especially in labor rooms. Sure. I had the misfortune to see a couple of cases of uh, soap induced colitis when I was doing DM. I actually presented the case in clinical meeting, and people were laughing at me because okay. they tell me I am mad because there was no entity like that. Okay, but uh, um, then uh, subsequently, when you closely observe, we can find that even soap can also produce uh, uh, colitis. It, it presents like something like acute diarrhea and get prolonged, and even even we may have suspicion that maybe inflammatory bowel disease. The picture may be like that of uh, ulcerative colitis. I have seen five cases. Okay, Doctor Jayanti, uh, Madam, are you there? Any comments? I, I, I mean, I've not got much of an experience after colonoscopy. Yeah. But I mean, soap and water, you know, was being given in my days and days. Doctor Krishnadas, have you got any experience on this? Doctor Krishnadas, are you there? Okay. So this is another thing. Can I have the next person in, please? Next back. Thank sir. you, Dr. Rohan. Uh, next person Thank is you, Dr. Sir. Sadish from Pushpagiri. Yeah. Dr. Sadish. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so the, this is a um, thing. Now, the, this is a um, there was a test match between England and uh, India. This was uh, going on in Ahmedabad. The, the people are English team has come in there, and Indian and cricket English team are both staying in the same hotel. But the English team, you know, are hit by sickness bug, and a lot of them are diarrhea. But Virat Kohli said that our people are okay. What do you think may be the reason for this? What do you think may be the reason for this one? The English people who came to Ahmedabad, they are all having diarrhea, but the Indian people are okay. What may be the reason for this? Are you there? 
Yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah, just come out with it. Don't Traveler's you diary, I will consider. Yeah, pardon? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Tra what? Traveler's diary. Uh, that is it. It's traveler's diary. Why do people, when they travel around their diary, huh? what is maybe the reason behind it? It is said that our microbes change when we move from one place to another. And as part of the adaptation, there are people who say that it is as part of the adaptation that you develop diary. You're right. Very much right. And do you know this person? Uh, he is the a god in Mexico, Mexican god, and it's called as Montezuma. Have you heard of Montezuma? What is the relation between Montezuma and Traveler's Diary? Do you know that thing? Do you know? There is something called Montezuma. No, sir. You know, Montez Montezuma was the ruler of uh, Aztec ruler in uh, Mexico. And it was found that many Spanish troops, uh, when they came to attack them, many of them died <coughs> diarrhea. And it was uh, presumed that it was Montezuma's revenge that made the, that repel them, and it's called as Montezuma's revenge. And this uh, this is one of the types of um, uh, traveler's diary that you get, and it's called as Montezuma's revenge, which occurs in Mexico. And then, uh, what do you call the traveler's diary that occurs in Delhi? There was a movie by that name. Anyone who knows the name of the diary? And it's called Delhi, Delhi or Hong Kong. Delhi, Delhi. Uh, Casablanca, Crud, Nine Runs, Tourist. These are the different names for traveler's diary. Traveler's diary. So I think this is the classical presentation is that a team from outside comes in, stays in the same total as the native team, one purple dollar of diary. That is the way you develop your, you think about traveler's diary. People even say that <coughs> you should never, this is, um, but I don't think it is scientific. Many people say that you should never order because they make the ice from tap water or not. And it is said that the crew in a plane do not take <coughs> ice from the uh, plane. <coughs> and it is said that if you want to prevent traveler's diarrhea, you have to heat the heat it, boil it, cook it, peel it, or just throw it, <coughs> throw it off. No, that is the way you prevent traveler's diarrhea. <coughs> Which of the statements about traveler's diarrhea is True. Now, if you are coming to India, let us say, it is you are recommended that you take antibiotic prophylaxis, or recommended only for, you recommended only for those with comorbidities. Rifamixin is the recommended for prophylaxis of traveler's diarrhea. If you want to, fluoroquinolones are recommended for prophylaxis. Which one of these statements are right? What about antibiotic prophylaxis? Uh, is it recommended for all people who are coming? Uh, so no, sir. Routinely, it is uh, not recommended. If it's a highly infected area, uh, we are uh, suspecting we can go for a prophylaxis. So in prophylaxis itself, uh, we'll give uh, option, sir. One is rifaximin is an option for a prophylaxis. Do you give Even a 200 mg TAD doses. Prophylaxis. When do you give? Uh, it is recommended for those with this, uh, which are coming to it later. Is uh, rifaximin recommended for prophylaxis? It's okay. What do you think? Yes, sir. Uh, Refaction is. Yeah. It, uh, uh, it can be given. It can be given in a 200 uh, mg TAD dosage. Why is it recommended? Or then fluoroquinolone? Why is it recommended? Refaximin is, uh, is uh, more recommended than fluoroquinolone. Why is that? Because, because uh, uh, fluoroquinolone, because of the, there are a lot of side effects. First, then uh, there is a resistance pattern also. So both these. Refaximin is non absorbed. Yeah, I think prophylactic diarrhea. So, uh, what are the indications of prophylactic diarrhea when a patient comes to. Uh, uh, what are the indications of prophylactic diarrhea? So, Pro when, so I think um, as it's. Uh, yeah, comorbidities like liver disease, kidney disease, and heart disease. And when you have inf uh, the, the, uh, insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, inflammatory bowel disease. A chlorhydria again. Another thing is a you know, patient on immunosuppressants and long term steroids and post surgery, like uh, ileostomies or post gastrectomy. These are the situations you need definitely you need uh, prophylactic antibiotics. One of the harms of uh, antibiotics is uh, can you go ahead? Yeah. yeah. Dr. Shine, you can go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Hemolytic uremic syndrome. What are the tires of hemolytic uremic syndrome? So one is uh, renal impairment, thrombocytopenia, uh, and uh, uh, anemia. Hemolytic anemia. That is microangiopathic hemolytic, hemolytic anemia. 
What is the most 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 common vector for that? Ah, 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 toxin. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. E. Coli. The the usually it is negative. What is the reason why it is negative? Uh, usually it's uh, caused by that uh, toxin, sir. So. Yeah, low bacterial counts are there, and then also Look. there is intermittent bacterial excretion as well. Bacterial. So, uh, if you give antibiotics now, especially in E. coli, zero uh, one five seven, and if you give antibiotics, it increases the uh, risk of HUS. What is your opinion about that? Yes, yeah, sir. It's increases. Studies show that increases the uh, risk of uh, HUS. Yeah. But uh, if it is uh, already HUS, you can uh, uh, consider antibiotics in that patient. What about anti-mortality agents in HUS? Uh, usually, sir, and anti-mortality anti anti -mortality anti -mortality anti -mortality agents they are actually contraindicated. What are the yeah, GA manifestations? Other GA manifestations of uh, HUS? Uh, uh, ulcerations, uh, uh, one, uh, 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 ulcerations, then uh, pancreatitis. Yeah, they can produce pancreatitis, they can produce colonic perforations, uh, ulcer. and uh, then they can develop peritonitis. What is the immediate differential diagnosis of HUS? A T, uh, T, uh, TTP, sir. Thrombotic thrombocytopenic. What is the ma main difference between HUS and TTP? It's a hypotension and a CNS uh, disorientation. It's yeah. a neurological, neurological manifestation neurological. is maximum in more in a TTP. I think what about the, this HUS? Now I asked a nephrologist in one hospital and the lady told me that uh, she has uh, not seen one in the last six months. She might have seen one. Whereas another neurologist in, uh, nephrologist in another hospital told me that that is the commonest cause of um, uh, in, uh, renal um, failure in young people. Now, I would like to get the opinion of other consultants like Dr. Jayanti, uh, can you, have you seen this HUS occurring after diarrhea? And uh, I, I, my personally, my experience with this is not much. Uh, Dr. Jayanti, have you seen this one? Yeah, sir, not seen in others. Dr. Varghese Thomas, have you seen this one? No, 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 sir. I have seen only during my learning phase. This is so much discussed about, possibly the nephrologists are seeing it. These are the recommended antibiotics for traveler's diarrhea, cithromycin, ciprofloxacin, norfloxacin, and so on and so forth. Then I think let us come to possibly the last session. I think we are, are you overshooting the time, Dr. Varghese? So, uh, yeah, 12 year old. Boy. Can I have the next person in, please? Thank you, Dr. Sadish. Next person is uh, Aniket. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Aniket, please. Who is that? Aniket. Uh, Aniket, okay. The, a 12 year old boy, persons with complaints of large, passing large volume watery stools of two weeks duration. He just goes to the toilets in the morning. He calls his mother, Come, come, see what I am passing. And as soon as she comes in and sees, a lot of water goes out of his bowel. Large volume watery stools, no dehydration, no blood or mucus. Initial workup was within normal limits. Uh, then uh, the, the sigma, I, I did a sigmatoscopy on these people and after he said that he has passed all this, I score only solid stools. The mucosa was normal. What do you think is the cause of diarrhea in this person? Uh, maybe some uh, bacterial infection, sir. Bacterial infection. No, no, the thing is that no, he is uh, passing a large amount of water in the morning, but it's not seen in the. Um, thereafter, it's okay. There is no dehydration or nothing is there. And then when I did a sigmoidoscopy, I found that you no, know, he said that they just passed a lot of stool, but I saw hard stools a little in the sigmoid, and the whole mucosa was normal. Yeah, Any, maybe factitious diarrhea also. Factitious diarrhea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know about uh, this story, you know, this story is by a person, a uh, uh, German, you know, who went to Russia. Now he said that uh, he went to Russia and he saw a deer coming to a stag coming towards him. <clears throat> and he took a um, gun and aimed. And he found that there was no bullet in his, uh, bullet in the gun. So he was e eating some cherries. So there are cherry stones or cherry seeds were there in his pocket. 
So he took the cherry seed into the gun, <coughs> aimed between the two eyes of the uh, deer and then fired. He, he was sure that he has hit the deer, but the deer ran away. After two or three months later, he found that he had not, uh, he, he was hit the bullseye because he saw a, a deer going around with her. Now you could see he was so a deer which is going around with the cherry tree in its forehead. A person who makes up the stories, do you know who, who, what is his name? He makes up his stories and then he of his adventures and uh, uh, he's a baron, you know, he uh, makes up stories of his adventures in Russia. What is his name? Do you know? His name is Munchausen. Yeah, Baron Munchausen. And factitious things are what are called as the Baron Munchausen syndrome, factitious disorder imposed on self is what is called as. So you have heard this story of uh, Munchausen hitting at there. There are many stories on Munchausen. It's a factitious disorder where the affected feel disease draw attention, sympathy, or reassurance to themselves. Munchausen syndrome have a history of they are getting hospitalized uh, often. They may even undergo surgery. And they come out with extremely improbable tales of their past experiences. <clears throat> so, factitious diarrhea may be due to self-induced the true increase in stool volume or the uh, apparent increase in stool volume. More than 90% of patients with factitious diarrhea are women and have a history of work in healthcare field. I saw a 16-year-old lady who came with her mother with a large bucket in her hands. And I think she showed me the whole of water with some stool here and there. She said that this is what her, her, her daughter has passed. No, a large bucket. And then, no, have you heard of what is called the Fawcett syndrome? There was some people, no, when I went in detail into the history of the first boy whom I presented, a 10 year old boy, he said that he was, when he was cleaning his, he wanted to clean inside the rectum also. So he cleans inside the rectum. And then when his mother comes in, he expels all the fluid out. And then I know it's very difficult to make a diagnosis because even if you are sure that you are dealing with a faucet uh, syndrome, you cannot tell the thing to your mother, to the mother, because unless you are very sure. But sometimes if you take a good history, people come out with this. And these are factitious diarrheas. And this was Munchausen syndrome occurring and uh, occurring in these people. Buckets, yeah. But one of the things is that what is the normal stool osmolality? If you look at the liquid in a liquid stools and then look at the osmolality what will be the stool osmolality 50 to 100 is it right? it is supposed to be uh, uh, the same as that of uh, normal fecal osmolality supposed to be almost that of plasma about 290 milliosmoles if it is less than 250 milliosmoles what does it mean what does it mean the lot of diluted it's about 120 or 150 or Hundred. What may be the reason why the stool osmolality has come down? When it because is water, if when it, you mix the stool with water, the osmolality will be very low. But if you find a stool with a osmolality about four hundred milliosmol, what may be the reason for that? Unabsorbable carbohydrates. Unabsorbed carbohydrates. I mean, uh, this is one of the reasons for uh, osmolality above four hundred is actually when it is mixed with concentrated urine. So when a person comes with uh, liquid stools and you're suspecting factitious diarrhea, one of the things you can do is to do the fluid osmolality. Yeah, uh, maybe due to the addition of urine. Yeah, Dr. Shine. So this is actually a, uh, a rare presentation. You can see a patient presented with a re repeated endocutaneous fistula. So, uh, So this the, this this is the 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 first visit the patient presented with a fistula here he underwent surgery for this fistula three times he underwent bowel resection two times and then after the the, the third surgery they found that a chopsticks with a, with blood on them were coincidentally detected in the trash of patient's room. And it has revealed that the endocutaneous fistula was caused by self-mutilation. And then a psychiatrist was consulted and the patient was discharged after these three surgeries. And initially they were unable to diagnose it as a um, um, Munchausen syndrome. 
Yeah, so I think um, factitious diarrhea, one of the things may be induced on self. And this is, uh, there is something called as Munchausen syndrome by proxy. What is that? The, the mother gives the child laxatives and brings her to the doctor. And I think they are very happy that they have fooled the doctors. You know, they, these people have diarrhea. And these are by what are called a Munchausen syndrome by proxy. And you know that the fictitious character Munchausen had a daughter by name Polly. <coughs> and some people call it as Polly syndrome. <coughs> it's one of the <coughs> examples of uh, child abuse. So I think that um, I would like to draw the line here. Any other comments or anything from Dr. Jayanti, Dr. Vaghis, or anyone is welcome. So thank you all for listening. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Very nice session, sir. A lot of learning points because we usually never touch on these, you know, because we practice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. But we never preach. <laughs> that was wonderful. I learned a lot. Well, uh, especially the seed. Uh, the seed it, was really good. The seed was very good. It, it is... Uh, uh, totally different, uh, different experience, sir. Uh, you have made acute listening to acute diarrheal class very wonderful. Uh, I never thought this would be so interesting. Okay, I am sure all the other students also would have been glued to the screen uh, because uh, the way you presented it is uh, made it very interesting. I just want to add that. I just want to add the story because we have a couple of minutes also. Uh, one of my colleagues in Calicut Medical College, a very obese person was uh, repeatedly calling me to his home with a severe acute diarrhea. And the request is actually, I is leaving the campus. So I go there with my residents, go there, start an IV line, etc. Uh, because there's a VAP now. <laughs> so this happened for the third time. Then I asked them. So he's telling, we go for weekend uh, uh, food from outside. And uh, I alone develop this problem. All the other family members do not develop this issue. So... Uh, then I, at some time or other, he has uh, told me that he has reflex symptoms. So I asked him, are you regularly taking PP? Ah, yes, yeah, because I am obese, I am taking twice daily PP. Mm. Okay. So that was that was the uh, enigmatic point because every other family member eats the same food, but he alone gets the infection. So people on PPA, because they have got the practically anesthetic, especially double dose PPA, are highly susceptible to diarrheal disease, especially acute diarrhea. And uh, the classic situation where the group who eats from outside get, will not work here because he alone is more susceptible and the food may not be highly contaminated. It may be marginally contaminated. So that was one thing which I noticed. Uh, have you noticed this PPA in this diarrhea, sir, in your clinical practice? I think we do see a PPA, especially you know, when a person travels in a train. We have seen people traveling train developing uh, diarrhea, so we have PPI induced diarrhea. That I have seen when they go on a travel and come back. It may be a manifestation of, uh, you know, they, uh, I have seen people on uh, when they travel with PPIs, they have seen, I have seen them developing diarrhea. Is it induced diarrhea is the other thing, no? Metformin, all these symptoms. are now causing a major issue. Watery diarrhea. What? In this typical watering, they just have two weeks diarrhea and then you keep and then you take the drug history and get that history out. Metformin is also causing a major issue now. Metformin, non standing metformin. I think I was very much impressed by our uh, the my knowledge of our uh, residents, you know, very good, and I think they know their stuff very well. And it was nice talking to them. Okay. Okay. Very encouraging. You are very encouraging. I always, I never encourage you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. So, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Narendra uh, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shain. Thank you for, thank you, Jayanti ma'am, for your expert comments. And thanks all the residents uh, for uh, having performed well. And uh, uh, thanks to all of the faculty members who have joined today's session. Dr. Sojan George, are you there? Sojan George is the treasurer of ISC Kerala chapter, and it is usual his uh, duty to say the word of thanks. I think on behalf of everyone, I want to say a big thank you to all of you, especially the faculty, for having done such a wonderful class today, sir. Thank you, and thank good night you. to all of you. Thank them for the, you know, the time they have taken to prepare those slides. It's not easy. Thank you. It's really not easy to prepare those slides. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of time. I think Sarah has taken a lot of time. More than one month preparation, I think. Yeah, I think you can share, share the PPT. Yeah.
it's only one and a half hours for the students to listen but it is more than one one month's preparation for some one month's preparation exactly yeah it is great it's great like in, okay it will be saved and it will be available for viewing from facebook as a video also facebook so, i will send it send it by mail to me <laughs> yeah yeah i will i will okay. it will be heavy video i don't know whether i can send it through email but maybe i can give you the link okay google drive yeah google drive thanks good night thank you good night to all thank of you. you thank you sir good night thank you. Okay, good night Good night. Good night.